we've seen that markets produce too much relative to the socially optimal quantity in the presence of negative externalities, and too little in the presence of positive externalities. And we've argued that you can use Pigouvian taxes or subsidies to cause markets to produce the socially optimal quantity and thereby eliminate the deadweight losses from externalities. Now we illustrated the intuition behind that, but when we do that we sometimes wonder whether we might not be missing something. Might there be a deadweight loss from the subsidy or the tax that lurks somewhere behind the scenes and we're not keeping track of it? So to check our intuition, we can go through an exercise of deriving the total surplus under the market and compare it to the total surplus under the Pigouvian policy. Now we can do that for positive externalities and Pigouvian subsidies or for negative externalities and Pigouvian taxes. But it turns out the exercise is a little bit more complicated for the case of Pigouvian subsidies and positive externalities. So that's the case I'm going to go through here. And then I'm going to ask you before the quiz to go through the same steps and do the same thing for Pigouvian taxes and negative externalities. So for positive externalities, we know that there are non-market participants who are getting benefits from the products in the market. So instead of using the demand curve for the social marginal benefit, we use the higher social marginal benefit curve that includes the additional benefits that non-market participants are getting. The market produces where demand is equal to supply, but by producing there, it's giving up producing some goods that would be producing positive social surplus, goods where the social marginal benefit is larger than the social marginal cost. And as a result, we leave potential surplus on the table and get this deadweight loss. So now we want to ask, what are all the surplus areas that we can add up for the market and under the Pigouvian subsidy? So we can compare the two. So we'll have two columns, one for the market and one under the Pigouvian subsidy. And we can begin by thinking about consumer surplus. So where is consumer surplus under the market? Well, under the market, the market price is paid by consumers and their surplus is everything above that price up to the demand curve, which includes the area A and B. When the Pigouvian subsidy is imposed, consumers end up with a lower price. We've put this wedge to the right of the equilibrium that's equal to this size, where the lower end of the wedge is the consumer price and the upper end is the price that firms receive. So consumers now pay this lower price and consume this larger quantity. Their surplus rises to this larger area above this price up to the demand curve, which includes areas A and B, but also C, D, and E. So the surplus now is A plus B plus C plus D plus E. Then we can think about firms and their producer surplus. <clears throat> producer surplus is everything below the price that producers receive and down to, to the supply curve. So under the market, firms receive this market price and produce the market quantity. Their surplus is everything below that price down to the supply curve, which includes area C, but also this area F. So their surplus is C plus F. Under the subsidy, the price that firms collect goes up and firms produce more. Their surplus is everything below that price down to the supply curve, B plus C plus F, but also these two areas in here, G and H. So it's now B plus C plus F plus G plus H. Then there's another benefit that we have to keep track of which is the benefit to non-market participants. We'll call that the externality benefit. So where would we see that in our graphs? Well, we can simplify the graphs a little bit, put our demand and supply curve 
in, and then our social marginal benefit curve. For this first good that's produced, in addition to the benefit that consumers get, which we've already kept track of, there's someone that gets this additional benefit. Same for the second good and the third good, and so on and so forth. All the way up until we reach the market quantity where the market stops producing. So the benefit to non-market participants under the market is this area between the social marginal benefit curve and the demand curve up to the market quantity. So in our picture here, it would be the area between these two lines up to this blue market quantity, which includes G, but it includes also this area I up here. So the externality benefit, the benefit to non-market participants under market level production is I plus G. What about when we impose the Pigouvian subsidy? Well, now we're producing this larger quantity. When we produce this larger quantity, we get additional benefits to non-market participants. Now, there's an additional benefit here, another one, and so forth. So now we have the area between these two lines up to the quantity that's being produced under the subsidy. So it includes areas I, G, and H, but it also includes the area J up here and the area K here. The area between these two up to this quantity that's being produced under the subsidy. So now we have G plus H plus I plus J plus K. G plus I plus J uh, plus H plus K. Finally, we have to keep track of the cost of the subsidy. So the cost of the subsidy is zero if we don't have a subsidy. But when we do have a subsidy, we're paying this much per unit for all of these units. So if we multiply this per unit cost of the subsidy times this many units of output, we get this rectangle. That rectangle contains B plus C plus D plus E plus G plus H plus K. But that's actually not a positive benefit. That's a cost. So all of that is negative. Now we're ready to add up the two columns to get our total surplus. So under the market, the total surplus is A plus B plus C plus F plus I plus G. Simply these letters added up. Well, these are a little bit more complicated to add up. So let's cancel some of the ones that appear negative and positive. So we have a negative B here and we've got a positive B here that'll cancel. We've got a negative C and a positive C that'll cancel. A negative D and a positive D. A negative E, positive E, a G, an H, and a K. So now we can add up what remains and we get A plus B plus C plus F plus G, plus H, plus I, plus J. Now we can compare the two. And we'll just cancel all the ones that appear in both and see what's left over. We have an A in both cases, a B in both cases, a C in both cases, an F, a G, an I, but we have a J and an H here that we don't have under the market. So we have this area J and H that we don't have under the market. 
but we do recover it under the Pigouvian subsidy. So what we're recovering is this triangle here. That's exactly the dead weight loss triangle that our intuition told us we would uncover if we use a subsidy to increase the quantity produced by the market under the subsidy. So we can see that when we go through the more careful uh, calculation of surplus before and after the market, we get exactly what our intuition told us before. The surplus that was left on the table when the market produced too little is recovered when the subsidy is imposed. Now again, you can go through the same steps for Pigouvian taxes and negative externalities. You'll get two columns again, but they won't have quite as many letters in them. The only thing you have to be careful about is that the externality benefit is actually an externality cost when there's a negative externality. So that will become a cost, and so these terms will be negative under the Pigouvian uh, tax with a negative externality. But other than that, the steps are the same, and you should get the same result, that when the Pigouvian tax is imposed with a negative externality, then the deadweight loss gets eliminated.